Well, thank you, Laurie. It's great to be here at St. Andrews. I just happened to come to service here this morning, and as you all advertise, I felt very welcomed. So <laughs> it was great to be here. And thank you to Jim Allen and the Salam Network for sort of putting this on your radar and helping this to come to fruition. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be associated with both of you. I have been making documentaries since uh, about the mid-1980s, and most have been about Louisville or about Kentucky. And in that time, I've made about 20, I would guess, that have been on KET or some other network. Uh, the work you'll see tonight is called Statues. This is what we stand for. And uh, it looks at our community, you know, our quirks, our dreams, and our shortcomings. You know, as it unfolds, I think you'll see that it's about a lot of different things, but primarily, it asks the question, is there anything we can do to get beyond the bitterness and anger that just seems to be so prevalent today? That's no small task, huh? But uh, I start off by looking at the debate that surrounded the Castleman statue in Cherokee Triangle. And if you've read the news or watched the news, uh, you know that this has been very controversial. A lot of strong emotions, uh, people of goodwill on sort of both sides of the spectrum just have very different opinions. Um, so to sort of give a public airing of this, the mayor set up these seven meetings that happened around Louisville seven different places. And this sort of caught my attention. I thought, well, that'll be a, a good way to get sort of a temperature of the community. So I went to all seven. and No, I went to six of the seven. I did miss one. And uh, from these meetings, I came to a definitive conclusion. We still don't agree on General Castle. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I was thinking about this this morning in service when Pastor Laurie talked about an artist who painted the same subject many times, but in different ways, with different materials. And he did this to allow himself to go deeper into the subject matter and to let the viewer perhaps see different perspectives. And Laurie also talked about how Jesus instructed the disciples to go fish the same waters where they'd been fishing all night, but to go deeper. And as we know, they were very skeptical, but then when they did it, they were amazed at the catch. So what I've attempted to do, comparing myself with Jesus, that's, that's it. No, but what I've attempted to do with this documentary is to go a little deeper into these questions that have plagued our community, that plagued our country, plagued the West for so many years, and to see if we might go deeper and look within ourselves and find a, bet, a better way to come at it. And so thank you for tuning in and for coming and uh, I hope you enjoy the program, and I look forward to talking with you afterwards about it. These are strange times, but we think better things are coming. It's a nice thought. I hope we're right. Polarize, to divide into sharply opposing factions. This is what they represent. It's said we are polarized. Hard to argue with that. And here's something else we can agree on. America is tearing itself apart. It's sad, and it scares the hell out of me. 
So I'd like to tell a story of how my community, Louisville, Kentucky, is attempting to come to terms with the polarization of today, the sins of the past, and our hope for the future. As a writer, I've been telling stories about Louisville most of my life, and this is how I see it. Remember when Charlottesville was the poster child for polarization? These days I can't help but think Louisville is a contender. Are we worse? Better? That's what I'm trying to find out. Who are we? What is it that makes us a community? Maybe it's geography or business. How about the people themselves? Is it about going to church or not? Voting, red or blue, or to hell with them all. Do we support the places that open doors for all of us? How are we with charities? What's the murder rate, divorce rate, the dropout rate? The mayor says we are a compassionate city. Are we? Then I had this thought. Maybe our public art tells the story. Look around. What has been chosen to represent us, to be our symbol? Then, once it's chosen, what do we like, dislike, vandalize, or just put in hiding somewhere? Let's try to agree on this. As a community, we have a checkered past with our public art. You see, I was there the day they installed the Derby clock. Remember the Derby clock? It was supposed to bring people back downtown. We loved it, and then we didn't. Now the clock's in storage, and I don't think it's coming out anytime soon. Then jump ahead to the 1980s. I was there the night the false fountain lifted off. The Chamber of Commerce said it was going to be our city symbol, more impressive than the St. Louis Arch, we were told. Then it broke down too much, and it didn't seem to be as high as advertised. Though to be fair, that was all about perspective. Frankly, we just seemed to be embarrassed by it. A clock? A fountain? Those were simpler times. These days we're arguing about statues and what they say about us. Yeah, I know, that's what set things off in Charlottesville and all over the country. But why Louisville? I always begin in, in describing the city by pointing out that funny thing about Louisville that some people call it the northernmost southern city and some people call it the southernmost northern city. And it does have a kind of in-betweenness. That always interested me about it, in part because I think questions like this one, like the question about the statues, take on a, um, a unique ambiguity there. And that goes back, I guess, to the whole problem of Kentucky in the Civil War as a border state, where the, where the brother against brother thing was not a cliche. That's John Jeremiah Sullivan, once from Louisville, now living in Wilmington, North Carolina. John is quite a writer, known nationally for his keen observations on the quirks of human nature. He's right about our in-betweenness, if by in-between, he means a town trying to turn the page on its past, a town searching for a fuller sense of community. Maybe this statue's debate can get Louisville out from in-between and shed some light on who we really are, or want to be. Think about this for a minute. With a statue, you are saying to the future, this is what I want you to remember about my generation. Hmm. Nice thought. Malcolm Gladwell said that. As a famous author and what some might call a public intellectual, 
He's thought a lot about what statues and public art can mean. And for that matter, so has our mayor. Yeah, public art can be very impactful for a city. In many ways, it represents the, the soul of a city. It represents how the city views its past and certainly its future. There are gathering places also, and I think places of contemplation where you say, you know, why is this here and what does it mean? How does it fit in today? Greg Fisher is in his third term as the mayor of Louisville. When it comes to public art on city property, he has the final say. Like other politicians across America, he's found that the question of statues is a minefield that needs to be entered with caution. So he called on Sarah Lindgren to help. Sarah is the public art administrator for Louisville Metro government. Mayor Fisher gave her the job of running the hearings that were meant to settle, once and for all, what is appropriate public art and what belongs on city property. Tough job. You've heard the expression of herding cats? There were seven hearings in all held throughout the community, open to all. The topic, public art, of course. Except at every hearing, the debate kept returning to what to do about General Castleman. Who is he? You will get a range of opinions on that front. And the historical context of this man on a horse is simple. It is a registered Civil War Confederate monument. I can understand somebody throwing paint on General Castleman's statue if they were told this is the statue of a Confederate general. This is misinformation. Honoring Castleman with the statue is tantamount to honoring George Custer and Adolf Hitler. We are doing knee-jerk reaction to misinformation. He represents what Lincoln and Grant and Sherman and all of the Republicans who were for a Reconstruction South that brought people in rather than turning them away and making them enemies for life, their families enemies for life. This is not Nathan Bedford Forrest, the founder of the KKK. In fact, Castleman was a moderate reformer operating within the constraints of this segregated society. The subject of this statue is a complex human being. Castleman joined the late 19th century movement to reunite the country so long as Northerners recognized Jim Crow practices and the folly of implementing racial equality. There is a battle going on in this country over our public histories because those images shape who and what we will be going forward. It only reinforces a wound that we, along with many others in this nation, believe we all should be trying to heal. But the core issue here is the original meaning of the 1913 equestrian statue of General Castleman, whether or not it was intended as a Confederate memorial or an attempt to perpetuate bigotry and racism. It was not. The only people who believe these statues today are symbols of white supremacy are those on the extreme right those on the extreme left. The whitewashing of John Castleman's history by all of the people in this room is nothing short of racist. And as a historian, I can tell you I knew something of the history. It is nowhere near as offensive as what I see every day in this city practiced by entities who claim to be the friends of West Louisville and African Americans. And we all love Louisville, that's why we're here. We're not erasing history. You know, if we need a statue to remind us of our history, we need better memories. So there it is. In less than three minutes, we have heard the essence of the Castleman debate. Seemed longer, didn't it? You should have gone to all the meetings. Would you agree the community is divided? The main thing I took away from all these hearings was, these people are well-intentioned, they all think they are right, and the nagging question remains, are we rewriting history or trying to tell it in a way the entire community can be included? And is that even possible? What we can say for sure 
is that a statue of John Breckenridge Castleman stood in this spot in what is called the Cherokee Triangle since 1913. The statue was embraced by many in the neighborhood as a symbol of the good living to be found there. How good? When F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote The Great Gatsby and he wanted to place a character in an elegant part of Louisville, he chose the Cherokee Triangle. Some say it was this house that inspired him. It's a neighborhood with a nice mix of people, many who might be called liberal, most of whom are white. The statue was erected at the urging of Castleman's powerful friends because of all the good he did. Those who wanted to move the statue point to the bad. You see, as a young man, Castleman fought for the Confederate Army, and detractors say he is now a symbol of white privilege and racism. Just think about the name itself, Castle Man. But can we blame him for that? He was born with it. Many in the Cherokee Triangle wonder how their man on a horse put them in the middle of this storm. Let's look at what another community has done more recently with public art. This beautiful park is in Birmingham, Alabama, a community once infamous for resisting the civil rights movement. You know, it was once called Bombingham because of the terrible violence that marred the struggle for equality there. Malcolm Gladwell offers another insight in describing this public art. He says, each side writes their own story and the winner's story is the one we call the truth. I think Malcolm would agree he's not the first to say this, but the thought does raise a good question which we can bring back to Louisville. What are the sides? Is anyone winning the Castleman debate? And what is the truth? Searching for clues, let's get back to public art in Louisville and see what happened before when a community went looking for a symbol. This is Barney Bright. Now, there was a sculptor. Among other great work, he created the Derby Clock in 1975. That's the one community leaders hoped would help our struggling downtown. The white folks were fleeing to the suburbs. Could anything bring them back? They, they said um, what we're looking for in a design to go downtown is something that, that, that says Louisville, Kentucky. You're in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and they actually used the words, we, we wanted to strong enough to bring people off the expressway to come see it. So maybe that's what the best public art does. Attracts people, brings them together, Gives them something to rally around? In the case of the Derby Clock, it was not the answer for downtown decline. It did not seem to bring people together, and a lot of people did not want future generations to think it represented them. There were, I've got a scrapbook of letters to the editor where people wanted to throw it in the river. They wanted to uh, blow it up. <laughs> they, they, they wanted to kill anybody that put money into it and resented tax money going into it, all those things. So it did have a lot of people that didn't like it. And some of these people, I think, after it was up a while and they, and they saw that it was not as ugly and, as they thought it was gonna be or whatever, I think they maybe came around. And I, over the years, I got the feeling that it had more, more friends than it had enemies. 
The negative reaction to the clock pales in comparison to what was said about the Falls Fountain, our other piece of public art the community fell out of love with. But I think we all know that negativity was more about how people thought the art looked. When we talk about General Castleman, most all agree it's a fine piece of art. At least some of the community's most gifted sculptors do. Castleman, on the other hand, I think is a, just a superb piece of sculpture. I'm looking at the technique of the sculptor that did it and think, oh, this guy's good. The way the, uh, the Castleman person is situated on the horse, it's as if he is riding the horse, not uh, just a person sitting on a horse. That, that person was riding the horse. As a sculptor, I look through a sculptor's lens. It wasn't so much a historical lens. Oh, it's really well done. It's very well done. Um, but it is another white guy. I mean, we were really shy of white guys around here. I don't know how they did it all by themselves. It's a miracle. Here's Dawn Yates at work. And she makes a fair point. There are a lot of statues honoring white guys in Louisville, and every other city in the Western world, for that matter. But let's try to get past gender, race, and artistic technique. It seems obvious the Castleman problem really comes down to his years as a Confederate soldier and today's politics. But then, all of a sudden, when the undercurrent of the Confederacy thing came up, I thought, oh, Lord, shoot. God, okay, well, all right. So understanding why they were put there to be intimidation for my people, I'm out. You know, it's not so much about uh, Castleman and Louisville as it's about Trump and Charlottesville. Some of the same things that surface there are present throughout American society, including in Louisville. Uh, we had our own monuments. Um, we had our own uh, concerns about white nationalists. Uh, we had our own uh, suppression of, of, of black voices uh, over the years. We had those symbols with us. James Pritchard and David Horvath have followed this debate closely. You could also say intensely. At most every meeting, they made their feelings felt with force but also with respect. For Pritchard, it's about honoring what he sees as facts. For Horvath, it's more about what he believes Castleman has come to stand for. Now we're looking at the, the, the interpretation of Castleman with the lens of the present day and what, it, what this symbol means, whether he's been a, a whitewashed Confederate soldier or an upstanding you know, citizen who had something to do with the park system. I don't think those are the issues at this point. The, the point is, what kind of symbol has it become in our community, and is it divisive? Presentism is a, is a word that's uh, brought up a lot these days with these arguments, and essentially, it's uh, judging people in past times on our contemporary values. Contemporary values, hmm. What are they, and what do they have to do with the general? That seems to be what Mayor Fisher is wrestling with. General Castleman, in particular, is a, is a much more complicated piece to evaluate, let's say, than the Confederate uh, symbol that was by U of L's campus. Oh, yes, the Confederate monument. A good example of contemporary values in action. Some backstory would be useful here. In 1895, a memorial to the Confederate dead was erected in the middle of a busy street near the campus of the University of Louisville. The original sponsors were an organization known as the Kentucky Women's Monument Association. They were affiliated with the United Daughters of the Confederacy, who in that time were very busy erecting monuments throughout the South or in Louisville's case, the almost South. They said they were honoring their fallen ancestors. Others felt they were all part of a Jim Crow era campaign to keep black people intimidated. 
Over the years, efforts were made to move the Confederate monument, at first for reasons of traffic flow, and later at the urging of civil rights leaders. In both cases, the efforts were resisted. One mayor in 1948, an otherwise progressive gentleman who lived near the monument on a street called Confederate Place, no less, aggressively blocked removal of the monument. This same mayor in 1948 proudly waved a rebel flag while leading a delegation of Louisville business elites to Madison Square Garden to watch a basketball game between the University of Kentucky and the University of Louisville. Today, the love of basketball continues, but nostalgia for the lost cause has faded for most. The pre-Civil War period could no longer be romanticized as an idyllic time when the living was easy, because that easy living was built on the backs of millions of slaves. In 2016, the monument was moved. Now it's in Brandenburg, Kentucky, overlooking the Ohio River. You know, while not an artistic triumph, this model of Confederate monument was popular. It was produced by the Muldoon Memorial Company, based right here in Louisville. An identical version of this statue stood on the grounds of the Capitol in Raleigh, North Carolina. Nearby was one of Henry Lawson Wyatt, the young private who was the first Southerner to die in the Civil War. There was also a tribute to Confederate women. Checking the dates for all these monuments, you'll see they were all dedicated around the same time, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It was a time when celebrating the lost cause of the South went hand in hand with Jim Crow laws and rigid segregation. Jim Crow, there's that name again. Who was Jim Crow? And why were all these terrible laws named for him? For better or worse, Louisville can make a claim to Jim Crow. Not the laws, though we had our share, but the man. It goes back to Louisville being a musical hotbed. The blues, jug bands, ragtime, they all had roots in Louisville. And this music came out of the many saloons, taverns, and theaters in town. In 1830, a struggling actor named Thomas Rice was performing at the City Theater, one of Louisville's finest. Rice developed a character for his act named Jim Crow. It was based on an elderly slave he had seen working at the stable next door to the theater, a stable named for its owner, Jim Crow. The Jim Crow character Rice introduced was an exaggerated and degrading caricature of the man he had seen working. Rice went so far as to buy the clothes off the man's back and wear them in his act. The act featured a song and a dance that was described by one writer as comic and grotesque. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. To say it was warmly embraced by the audience is an understatement. That night, Rice received 20 curtain calls. Jim Crow made Rice a wealthy and sought after performer. White and black performers took on the role. For decades to come, the Jim Crow character became a fixture on the stage and screen. The character became so identified as a dehumanizing stereotype that the Jim Crow name was given to the period of enforced inequality that followed Reconstruction, as well as to any law that denied rights to people who weren't white. 
So it's understandable if any statue erected during the time of Jim Crow is eyed with suspicion, if not outrage, by those wanting to move beyond our history of racism. However, defenders of the Castleman statue maintain this monument honors his almost 50 years of civic contributions and should not be confused with Jim Crow politics. This sounds nice, but can a case really be made for that? Castleman supporters point to the newspapers of the time, which considered the question of erecting a statue to a person while that person was still alive. The reporter wrote in 1913, It would be unfortunate to pull a statue from its pedestal and cast it in the junk pile because of the honored individual having failed to live up to the dignity of the design. But as General Castleman is not a political hero who may be damned tomorrow by those who applaud him today, and as he will certainly not turn traitor to the parks, why not set him up in bronze now instead of waiting to pay him the compliment? The friends of General Castleman are to be congratulated upon their determination to honor a useful citizen while he is among the quick instead of allowing the matter to go over till he is among the dead. In 1913, this writer, and apparently much of Louisville, had no question about who John B. Castleman was. A genuine hero. So build that statue. By 2018, the Castleman identity was not so clear. The Committee on Public Art listened patiently considered all angles, and submitted a report to the mayor. They emphasized that their recommendations pertained to public art in general, and not specifically to the general. That raised a few eyebrows. The key passage in the document was, we urge our community to continue the work of open dialogue, not only about public art and monuments, but about all symbols of racism and discrimination, and how we as a community can move forward to advance equity, inclusivity, and healing. Wouldn't you agree, it would be hard to find more commendable contemporary values. Mayor Fisher thanked the committee for their hard work, considered their conclusions, and then said, it is time to move the Castleman statue out of the public eye. So that's that. Some celebrated the decision, but the Friends of Louisville Public Art did not. They were a new group formed to support public art in general, and as you might guess, one general in particular. They contested the mayor's decision in court. When the case would be decided was anybody's guess. So who was the real John Castleman? It seems identity can be hard to pin down. Just consider the saga of the Derby clock. There's a very interesting story about the Derby clock that I'm not sure is remembered anymore in Louisville, but it really gets at, at the weirdness of what we're talking about and the difficulties involved when you try to speak for a city with a, with a statue. Remember John Sullivan from earlier? He pointed out Louisville's tug of war between North and South and how this can complicate a lot of things, including a community's identity. Barney Bright, the sculptor who created the clock, really wanted one of the figures identified to be African American. He, he, he wanted that segment of the community to be, to be represented. And he chose uh, a figure named Ben Harney, very interesting musician and very interesting character in American musical history. Ben Harney put out some amazing recordings in 1898, including one called Mr. Johnson, Turn Me Loose, that is about a local policeman who used to bust up gambling dens. Great song.
The song begins one dark night in Louisville. A policeman, Mr. Johnson by name, is walking his beat, which happens to include some very lively bars. Mr. Johnson had a problem with lively bars, and that's where Ben Harney made his living. He went down in history as an early, influential black performer, Ben Harney. Now, this bar was on Green Street, and in those days, sometimes the police looked the other way on Green Street, but not in the song that made Ben Harney famous. Well, Barney Bright uh, put him in the, in the derby clock um, as, as the representative of black Louisville history which was not a, a crazy or misguided thing to do. I mean, people call him the inventor of ragtime. He's a great Louisvillian, black musician. Ben Harney made quite a bit of money off his songs and the new musical form he was eager to take credit for. He got out of the small bars, toured the country, and was a hit on Broadway. And Mr. Johnson, he kept walking his beat. Told you before, no gambling. And then people started reaching out to, to Bright and, and saying, um, you know, Ben Harney was a white guy. He wasn't, he wasn't black. And a woman got in touch with Bright and said, I knew Ben Harney and he was, he was as white as a lily. Mr. Johnson showed no mercy to the people on his beat. And life didn't end well for Ben Harney either. Musical styles changed. And Ben Harney died penniless, buried in an unmarked grave. As I understand it, Bright sort of transformed him into Oliver Cook, the trumpeter, um, who, who wound up playing that, that role in the Derby Clock. But it just, it just shows you how messy things get when you try to symbolize or speak for a human community, which is always going to be this evolving, um, many-faced thing. When you try to speak for it through a statue or, or a memorial, which is so fixed and so, so unchanging, really, to the extent that it, it can't, it can never really express um, the soul of a, of a community very well. Again, unless it's abstract and, and open, like an arch, like a beehive. Those things do better. Isn't that a story? Barney Bright had the best of intentions, but he didn't have his history quite right. Once he learned of his error, he simply reshaped his statue. I've always wondered why he didn't go with Muhammad Ali for the clock, but this was 1975 when Ali had not been as warmly embraced by his hometown as he is today. Time can smooth things over. Now I wonder if the Ben Harney lesson could be applied to General Castleman. Barney Bright thought he was doing a good thing and then rebounded nicely when he learned he wasn't on the right track. Following Barney's lead, should we put a different face on Castleman? How about Isaac Murphy? that great black jockey from the late 19th century. He did win three Kentucky Derbies. But then again, a horse racing theme may not be the way to go these days, contemporary values being what they are. Sullivan's suggestion of a more abstract symbol for a community has appeal. But at the time we talked, so much has happened since then, I wasn't so sure about his solution for removing outdated monuments. John's present home of Wilmington, North Carolina has considerable Civil War history and the statues to celebrate it. This one salutes George Davis, once the Attorney General for the Confederate States of America. It is erected on a site once called the Shambles. A thriving slave market once existed here. John does not think the statue's placement was accidental. He envisions how such statues could be removed. I, I really feel like this movement has to come from within. I don't like the idea of 
police and soldiers coming in and, and tearing down these statues of the middle of the night in an almost surreptitious way. What I would like to see in Wilmington, along with, with some other like-minded people, is trying to, to make the, the taking down of these statues and the replacement of them with more meaningful symbols a community action that's black and white. Imagine what that would be like. Imagine the message that would send if instead of these these scenes of, you know, heavy machinery coming in to rip down the statues and then kind of meaningless street scuffles the day after between different camps of protesters. Imagine instead if you saw thousands of people marching through the streets toward the statues, black and white crowds together and saying, this, this can't stand, these can't be here, we're taking them down. For it to happen in a conscious way like that, I think would have tremendous value and would be a real rectification and, and, and redemption of a lot of years of, of just historical confusion. How can you not salute John's vision of an ideal solution? Yet I must admit, when I interviewed him in 2019, his proposal seemed, at best, naive. A nagging part of me thought of another time when large crowds gathered in the streets of Louisville. It wasn't our finest hour. This is a monument the people of Louisville erected to honor Jenny Bowman. It stands in Cave Hill Cemetery. Ms. Bowman, 24 years old, worked as a maid in a fine home on Brook Street in 1887. I'm now relying on newspaper reports found in the Courier Journal from that time. They tell quite a story. On the morning of April 21st, Jenny Bowman was in the house alone when robbers broke in. She resisted them, was beaten, and later died from her injuries. The perpetrators were caught and held in the Louisville jail. A crowd of Louisville citizens, estimated at 15,000, marched on the jail, wanting to deliver a speedy form of what they thought was justice. The Courier-Journal reporter described their mood. Madness all but consumed the better judgment of the city's indignant population, and her fair name for righteousness and justice hung in the balance. The militia was called out, led by none other than General, well at the time he was a Colonel, John B. Castleman. He led the militia in stopping the crowd from executing their will. The inmates were later hung in the official manner. So, in light of the Jenny Bowman case, I'm not sure about the crowds in the street solution. But before we move on, some other details are worth thinking about. The second man to be hung, William Patterson, always maintained his innocence. Now, Patterson had a well-earned reputation as a frequent criminal, but he swore he was not involved in this particular crime and he did have an alibi. Of his alleged partner in crime, Albert Turner, there apparently was little question of guilt. A jury convicted Turner after conferring for five minutes, and he was hung in short order on July 1st. His request for execution sometime after July 4th was denied. What's interesting is Albert Turner repeatedly testified that William Patterson had been his accomplice. Yet, as Turner stood on the scaffold, moments prior to his death by hanging, he reversed his story, declaring Patterson was not guilty and should be set free. This complicated matters. Months went by. The newly elected governor, Simon Bolivar Buckner, considered William Patterson's appeal for clemency, but then rejected it. For what it's worth, Governor Buckner, like Castleman, once fought for the Confederacy. Obviously, a Confederate past did not make one less popular in the Kentucky politics of the time. At any rate, his appeal denied. Patterson's execution was scheduled for June 22, 1888, at 6 a.m. 
According to the Courier Journal, the morning of the 22nd, a crowd began to gather at 2 a.m. Saloons were kept open in recognition of the needs of the public. The reporter noted with a wry bit of observation that while Patterson was receiving one kind of spiritual comfort from the preachers in his cell, the saloon keepers were dealing another kind out to thirsty patrons. The reporter also made note of Patterson's unusual posture in prayer. He called it peculiar and remarkable, an oriental posture in which Patterson has no equal. The paper even carried an illustration. Meanwhile, those in the waiting crowd told jokes and recalled other hangings. The preachers who accompanied William Patterson sang his favorite hymns, among them, He's a Lily in the Valley. The reporter noted that Patterson sang with much fervor, if not with much regard for musical sound. Then the time came and Patterson was taken from his cell. On the scaffold, he continued to proclaim his innocence, after which he was hung. Except the noose wasn't properly positioned on his neck, and instead of breaking his neck, it served only to slowly strangle him, by all reports taking some 15 minutes to do so. One of the seasoned observers said, it was one of the most awful scenes that has ever been enacted at a legal hanging in the state. Murders and mobs and botched executions and bombings and white privilege and more white privilege generously seasoned with Jim Crow. Then there's the continuing reminder of all the Confederates in our closets. Why? Why revisit such disturbing matters? There's this thought from one of our country's most admired writers, a man some call a conscience of Kentucky, Wendell Berry. He said, you can't improve your history by hiding the evidence. Actually, Mr. Berry says he is quoting his brother John. And though he wasn't referring to Louisville history in particular, if I'm understanding his point, it could be applied. I take it to mean that one might be horrified by or even deny aspects of history. But if you can get beyond denial, there can be understanding of what moved people to behave in such a way. Then, it is hoped, you not only learn the right lessons, but also act upon what you have learned. It can be painful, but can progress come without it? Does stopping a lynching make Castleman a hero? Actually, with the help of the militia, he stopped several lynchings and a riot in Frankfurt. Does this and his other civic contributions make him worthy of a statue? As we've seen, in his day, many thought so. But answer this. When his statue was erected in 1913, would there have been the same impulse to honor York, the black man who played an important role in the Lewis and Clark expedition? Ed Hamilton is the creator of the York sculpture. His work, locally and nationally, has received much acclaim. Like so many other area sculptors, Ed got his start with Barney Bright. You know, Ed even helped with the Derby clock. That experience, and a long, successful career, has led Ed to recognize that the tides of history can be hard to gauge. A statue's power to inspire can just vanish. I guess they lose their power when times change, neighborhoods change, uh, cityscapes change, and sometimes stuff kind of gets put back to the, <laughs> the back burn. I, I, I don't know. Let's go to the Belvedere and we see York. Will one day York will be kind of out of step, you know?
you just you can't call it. Well, behind me is um, Ed Hamilton's York. This is one of my favorites. And it was part of the bicentennial celebration of the Lewis and Clark expedition. York's story has been told in very different ways over the years. Dr. Daryl Milner, Professor Emeritus of Black Studies at Portland State University, described the extremes as either Sambo or superhero. Sort of makes you wince, doesn't it? The Sambo version was most common until the past 40 years or so. It said York was part of the expedition, but pretty much as a loyal manservant doing menial jobs. Then, according to Dr. Milner, in recent years, York has emerged larger than life as a superhero, a powerful figure who overcomes not only the harsh elements of the West, but also the ignorance and prejudice of his companions. Ed was really struck by the way that the Native American cultures saw York purely for his physical presence and his ability as a hunter and as a, as a leader in the expedition. This tall, powerful man, his dark skin, and they found him to be a very powerful spiritual presence. They named him Big Medicine. So Ed really wanted to focus on how York looked to the Native American cultures, not necessarily the way he looked as, as a person held in slave, um, slavery by the white explorers. And so that is why we see York in this very powerful stance, looking over the river with his arms bare, his rifle, his tools on his belt, using that powerful gaze of a hunter and as a leader of the expedition through the territory and even that, the heavy brow that would have been seen on, an, on a man from Africa. So I think it's a very powerful piece in what it can teach us about perception even today and perception at the time of the expedition um, from the various cultures. So which York story is true? In these times of alternative facts, it's hard to say. But I suspect that as with so many cases, the truth is probably found somewhere in between. And you know, though the stories of York and Castleman are very different, it is interesting how each has been shaped by contemporary values. York went from Sambo to superhero. Castleman, once the model of Southern manhood, is now seen by some as Bull Connor on horseback. As with York, the Castleman reality is probably somewhere in between. So a question worth considering is, did General Castleman simply fall out of fashion, or have we evolved so much as a community that we can no longer tolerate his failings? Are those working to move the statue, wanting to sweep an uncomfortable part of Louisville's past under the rug? Isn't that in itself a form of privilege? Out of sight, out of mind. On the other hand, are those cherishing Castleman as a pillar of the community, glossing over a very obvious point? The community of his time was built on a Jim Crow caste system is either group perpetuating a lie, Louisville's lie. I'd like to make the case that most communities, like people, tell themselves lies or hide the evidence of their history. We want to cover parts of our past we haven't come to terms with. This can lead to problems in the present. For instance, John Jeremiah Sullivan's city of Wilmington had a whopper of a lie. In 1898, a group of white citizens, unhappy with the prosperity and growing power of Wilmington's black citizens, decided to try to turn back the clock. And they did a pretty effective job. They unseated duly elected government officials and then forcibly removed or killed hundreds of black Wilmingtonians. It's now acknowledged as a coup d'etat, the only one ever recorded in our American democracy. It is only in recent years the event has been more fully explored. 
A memorial site has been established remembering the victims. The author of a recent book about the incident drew hundreds to a reading at the Wilmington Library. It seems many in Wilmington have come to terms with their lie, or at least one of them. Wilmington's lie has been confronted in public and in public art. This is what democracy looks like. And yet the work goes on. Let's return to what Malcolm Gladwell said. With a statue, you are saying to the future, this is what I want you to remember about my generation. For better or worse, the life of John Castleman spoke to the early 20th century. York speaks to us today. In a less polarized time, there might be room for both in our community's public art landscape, in our community's memory. Not today, though. We leave it to the courts to decide. The court did decide and said that it was within the mayor's rights to remove the statue. So at first light on June 8, 2020, he did. This was not exactly John Sullivan's vision, but there were similarities. There definitely had been crowds in the street prior to the removal, black and white marching together, united in purpose. Louisville, like most of the nation, had been convulsed with protests due to the violent deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, David McAtee, and the ghosts of countless victims over the years. Combine this with a pandemic which had kept people cooped up, frightened, and frustrated for months with no end in sight. The ingredients for change, significant change, were in place. Some have called it a reckoning. Where do we go from here? Across the country, statues are falling like leaves from a magnolia tree. Arrests, resignations, and promises of reform lead most news breaks. Now there's a new generation who will tell the next one, this is what we stand for. What might that be? Will recent events bind old wounds and launch us toward a better, less polarized future? It's a wonderful thought, but I think we can agree there are still bridges to cross. Unlike the Derby clock or the Falls Fountain, the Castleman statue was never suggested as a tourist attraction or as a symbol for Louisville, but in the end it became one. It stood for a community stuck in between the lessons of the past and moving forward. So what did the years of meetings, debate, and protest accomplish? Time will tell. But whatever you may think, there is little doubt John B. Castleman became so much more than a guy on a horse. Like the old song said, he wouldn't turn us loose. And now, just a few more thoughts. This story began with me wondering about polarization and if we could still expect better things to come. And why wouldn't we? It's all part of the American dream, right? So what do we need to get there? John Castleman once wrote that from our needs grow the utilities of each age. In his age, I think the utilities he was referring to were tangible assets like railroads or electricity, or, of course, the saddlebred horse he did so much to popularize. What are the needs of our age? <laughs> Where to begin? What sticks out to me is the great need to actually see each other and then recognize ourselves. 
Hey you, look, on the surface, it may not thrill either one of us, but you're part of me, and I'm part of you. It seems, unless we can accept this truth, the polarization will continue and harden to a point of no return. You know, it's not like we have to hang out. We do need to reach out. In the past, we built monuments for Jenny Bowman and many others to show who or what we honored. Monuments are nice, but no matter how finely made or how worthy the subject, they won't make a difference unless we honor each other. That's with all our differences, our shortcomings, our accomplishments. There will be crises, and they must be addressed. But this spirit, this honoring our common humanity, must be the utility of this age. Yeah, I know how simplistic that sounds. It is hard, and it's obvious we don't have much practice. But if we could pull this off, or at least make a beginning, then maybe better things will be more than words and a dream. It's all about community, right? just asking a question and I'm sorry that you all missed that but you heard Morgan's <laughs> answer I will say um, Diane was making the point that one of the things that she that she had seen so much more this second time than the first time um, watching the film and then she was also talking to, and tell me if I'm not not saying oh. you right Diane she was talking about how instead of thinking about things as right and then wrong that we can think about it as right and then right, and then right, and then right. Like the right can change. It's not just a, a right and wrong. I, would, I have a question. Um, one of the, uh, I mean, the whole issue of, of statues or even naming streets, uh, that sort of thing after people have this dilemma and th that you've encapsulated in the film, uh, one of the interesting solutions I've heard to that problem is that all of those things be given term limits so that essentially a statue goes up and every 20 years, 25 years, 50 years, whatever it is, the, the people of the time have to agree on, have to vote and say, yeah, that thing should stick around. We think it's a good idea or no, that thing needs to be removed for one reason or another. Maybe we're just tired of looking at it. Um, I just wondered, did that come up at all in the considerations about this? And what are your general feelings about that? Is that sort of a superficial solution or does it have some merit? I think it's a wonderful idea uh, for my friends in the uh, sculpture business. I think they would embrace it because, you know, more work. Uh, but yeah, I mean, one thing that becomes so obvious is that heroes of one age are not the heroines of another age. And so, I mean, things shift and uh, as Ed Hamilton said, you know, uh, you just can't call it. And, uh, you know, Castleman, if somebody in 1915 had said, this guy is going to be essentially uh, defiled with paint and sort of stuck away in a corner, people would have he was the person of the community at that time. And, and seemingly not just in the white privileged community, but, and, and it's hard to tell for certain, but you know, things came out, he was evaluated in a, di in a different way. And I think that's, that's our right to do that. Um, so I like your suggestion, have term limits. <laughs> Yeah. 
And as uh, John Sullivan said, you know, maybe making statues of famous people, men, women, uh, all genders, uh, maybe that's not a good idea. <laughs> but, yes. <laughs> so my question, to, my question to Morgan is, in his work of doing this documentary, has he found that there were people like that do public art or schools of art or sculptures? Did they were they thinking about or embracing more or looking forward as far as how they how public art is done going forward? That it be more not of specific people, but more of either abstract ideas or things, or of unspecific people, maybe of people, but not a specific person. So I'll let you. <laughs> yeah, and I, I didn't go to a lot of uh, schools of art, but I think you are seeing that, like the pub, uh, the Sarah, the, the, the public art administrator here for Louisville, the pieces that they have implemented in recent years have very much been of that type of, well, like Han Hannah Drake and uh, a group called The Unknown Project, I think, did something at the foot of uh, 10th Street right at the river where they showed where enslaved people used to come to try to escape. And it's just footprints and things of that nature. And it's extremely powerful and it really conveys a message. And so I think there is that great leeriness right now of making a statue about any one uh, uh, important person, quote unquote. They were important in that moment, but they're trying to do more themes and uh, broader ideas. And what the history actually is versus the person? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, would, I would say that as an example of what you're talking about in Washington, D.C., if you look at the monument to the Korean soldiers who are not identified, or even more specifically, the monument of names that surrounds the Vietnam War veterans or war dead. It's, it's amazing and it's a very powerful, I expected to have no feeling whatsoever, but it gripped me in a way that no monument has ever gripped me. And I read the names of even some of those dead in the Vietnam tragedy. Right. And you know, Louisville's own Grady Clay was the chair of the committee that selected, is it Maya Lin? Was that who did the sculpture there of the monument? I think so. Uh, so hats off to Grady. Because I mean, at the time, that was a controversial and courageous choice. You know, they wanted, something, uh, you know, it was seen as, seen as too stark and not heroic enough. And uh, I think it has stood the test of time very well. Jim Aylin here um, from the Salam Network. Uh, and this is the third time, Diane Snow, this is the third time I've seen the film. And it is richer at, at that, with that experience. Um, we, we know in, to educate, in educating, Repetition is the mother of retention. So if you see something once or, or more than once, you're going to get more out of it. And the film has so many rich dimensions to it. Uh, if you want to see it again, it's on YouTube. So all you have to do is search statues. This is what we stand for. Is this what we stand for? And you can see it again. That's where the film originated in the viewing this evening. So I, I recommend that. And you can share it with your, your, your friends with a link. Uh, one other thing is that our network has worked because we believe that it somewhat it is in human nature, or certainly it's in history, that we all fabricate the other. And it is the other. Uh, Morgan leaves us a little hanging because the solution is not so uh, uh, black and white, if anything is. Uh, so 
um, we, we fabricate the other. I mean, right now, we all have an, an other, right, that we're trying to cope with and uh, many, many different dimensions. Um, but to, to try to, to get beyond that, you have to make people aware of, of, of that creation. You have to educate them. And I believe you have to change their hearts. You ha it has to be an emotional change. Um, it, it can't be just intellectual uh, because that, that's a little bit too shallow. Uh, but uh, once again, if you want to see the film again and share it, it's uh, available out there. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I've got a question in the chat. Um, so throughout the, the movie, there was lots of different hymns used in particular as, as uh, underlying music. Yeah, and Sandy Renner on there uh, particularly noticed Nearer My God to the, I think particularly when the, uh, the UFL statue was used. Just a comment on kind of why you picked um, or had certain preferences for music and hymns in particular? Well, in, in, in that instance, uh, first, Sandy, I must ask you, are you any relation to Chris Renner, the, the basketball coach at Ballard? <laughs> because uh, I did a documentary in which Chris played a very big role, and he's a wonderful guy. But uh, back to the hymn, uh, that, uh, in reading the old newspaper accounts, that hymn was actually played at the uh, opening ceremony of that statue and I mean it was quite the festive I mean there were I forget the the crowd count but it was like half of Louisville was there and uh, one of the things that struck me talking about crowd counts was in the mob that came for the guy in, that was in the jail uh, uh, Patterson they, they counted it as 15,000, and I looked at the population of Louisville at that time, and it was like 30 or 40,000. <laughs> I'm wow. thinking like, and so either it was a grossly overstated crowd count or, you know, half the community had gone bonkers. Yeah. But well, perhaps yeah, in, in the case of the music, I would always look to see if I could find what is, you know, was there something that was actually played at that time? Like when the man went from the jail cell to his hanging, that was the song that was being sung by pastors who had come there to comfort him. So uh, where, when, whenever I can find it and I can get the rights to it, I, I use it. I wanted to hear a little bit about... Um, like how long this whole process took to put this in, there was a lot of information in this film. And did you write the whole script or, I mean, how it got all put together? Just a little bit about, since we're fortunate enough to have you here, I'd like to hear about the process. Well, it was, um, as sort of the storyline reflects, it was a long and winding story. Uh, uh, as often happens when something is not commissioned and you don't have a client demanding it by a certain date. And uh, so I knew that something about the hearings with the Castleman question, I thought there's something here and then as it, it just seemed to un to lead to something else. And uh, then, you know, the question with the George Floyd murder and tragedy, all of it took other heightened, uh, not interest, that's too, but I mean, there were whole new dimensions that came out. And so that led down other roads. And so from start to finish, it was probably two, two and a half years, which is not, and it's not something you work on all the time because you have other things that you hope generate income and documentaries typically do not <laughs> do that. And uh, so, but you know, it's something that's always in your mind. Or, and my wife and I have a home near our grandchildren in Wilmington, North Carolina. So I would be there a month or two out of each year, and in doing that, 
we, in so many ways, there were similar things going on. I mean, they finally took down their statues, which was, mon <laughs> no pun intended, monumental for them because uh, that was very much a very, very much a Confederate city, and people really clung to that. And uh, so, so that was interesting to see. But uh, yeah, about two and a half years. And you know, the hope is, you know, it, it comes out. It's shown one night on KET, and and you're like, is that it? And so, uh, I hope that thirty, fifty years from now a historian or a researcher can look at it and go, huh, there was, these are some of the things that were going on at that time. Uh, I mean, the Castleman question was so mixed. And, and I had good friends who I respect very much on both sides of the question, you know. Uh, and I think a lot of people in Cherokee Triangle would be called liberals, and a lot of them just could not see why, why Castleman would be tarred with the same brush that all these other statues were. And then somebody else would say, yeah, but this, this, and this, and it's complicated. <laughs> In uh, college at UK, I saw a film called Rashomon, or I think I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, but it's a Japanese film in which like eight different people see the same incident and they tell a different version of the story. And you see that with history. And uh, it's just the prevailing power structure that gets the, their story sort of comes to the fore. And uh, it's not always completely true. Yes? Uh, I think one of the things that the film really has helped us with is especially in this day and age, people will make decisions without knowing the facts. So this gentleman here has been researching the facts, and I think it gives us a much better pers perspective on the subject if we know the facts, and in that way we kind of know what we're talking about. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. And then someone who didn't agree with my version of the facts would go, yeah, but. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. But thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, lear I learned so much uh, tonight that I, I feel like I'm, I'm in the first grade. Uh, <laughs> but one thing that I did learn is I've often wondered where Jim Crow came from, and I didn't know that he came from Louisville. Thank Isn't that you an very amazing much. story? Really yeah. Thank you. Folks on Zoom and folks in person, and thank you, Morgan and the Salam Network, for a wonderful start to our Black History Month program. Uh, we are so grateful uh, for the work that you put in and, and for the questions and everything that you have uh, sparked in our mind for the rest of the month, I think, as well. well uh, particularly as we drive around our own city and see, um, see these statues and see the ongoing conversation, of course, um, far and wide. So thank you, folks, on Zoom. Thank you, uh, Morgan. And you can wave at each other goodbye. <laughs> goodbye.